<coughs> World Dishes Forum of Fairhaven College, and our own community food co-op have all generously um, contributed to um, get Percy here. Uh, perhaps even a greater contribution is from the Lopez Community Land Trust, which actually got him in our region in the first place. So we'll be speaking tomorrow. So um, thank you very much for um, the honor of being in Percy's presence and uh, the benefit of hearing, sharing his experience. Um, so before we get started, um, Percy, I imagine, is going to have a few interesting things to share. And you might have questions to ask of some of Percy's experience. And if you do, um, I'm anticipating there might be a lot of questions, if you could write your question down on a piece of paper or a canola leaf or something, and I'll pass it forward, and then we'll try and sort those questions into themes so that we don't ask the same question over and over again. Um, but if you have a question, write it down, pass it to the front row, and then we'll, we'll collect those um, any time during the presentation. If you want to think of something, write it down. All right, um, it's my great honor to um, present to you uh, Percy Schmeiser, who is a farmer, an advocate for farmers, a um, courageous individual, um, challenging trends that some of us are concerned about. Um, those trends include um, some of the, the most profound changes since the origin of agriculture, uh, some 10 or so thousand years ago, depending on where you live, where we are now in an era in which we're combining genetic heritage of completely different organisms and then eating the results of that. Um, <laughs> Along with that has come the um, patenting of life, which is an interesting concept for a biologist or a sociologist or anyone that thinks about the relationship between ownership and life. Uh, and we're also in an era in which the relationship between humans and their food um, now, to a large degree, has an intermediary, which is neither human nor food. And that is changing our world. Um, what we eat, how we get it, where it comes from, and that sort of thing. Percy has been at kind of unwittingly or, or without his intention at the center of, of many of those debates in which he, if you haven't paid attention to some of the, the debates over agriculture, save, seed saving, and genetically modified organisms, um, was um, taken to court by one of our largest um, corporations that produces, called Monsanto, and challenged for um, having uh, Monsanto's Roundup Ready seed on his canola fields. And that challenge worked its way up to the Canadian Supreme Court. Um, unlike most people, uh, Percy, did not acquiesce to the, the greater financial and legal powers and pursued his case. And the rest is uh, history that I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about. Um, he also refused to submit to a gag order in a subsequent settlement. And that's why he can speak to us today. And so, without much further ado, present to him a small token of our affection, a Huxley College mug. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but most importantly, <laughs> you already have to it's, it's really a, a pleasure for myself to be here with you this afternoon in the state of Washington. Uh, five days ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and it was a very interesting meeting in regards to uh, that everyone should have the right to know what's in your food. And I'll speak on that Oh, I'm sorry. Everyone should have the right to know what's in their food. And that was the theme in Washington, D.C., the right to know. Anyway, I come from Western Canada, the province of Saskatchewan. And if you drew a line from the center of Montana, straight north, about 250 miles, that's where I come from, 
and my airport city is the city of Saskatoon. I should maybe give you, before I go into it uh, a little bit further, a little history about our family. As I said, we, uh, uh, we come from Saskatchewan, but in Saskatchewan, we were known as seed developers and seed researchers uh, in canola. Uh, my wife did a lot of that research, and when we were married in 1952, she took that over almost completely. And we were developing new varieties of canola suitable for our climatic and soil conditions. Uh, besides being uh, in, uh, we are also in business in farm equipment, but primarily our love was the farm and the farmland. And I was, because I was involved with many other activities, my wife did most of the research, and as I said, in canola. I was in government, I was a member of the provincial government, I was in agriculture, and then my role in government, I always thought I worked for rules, laws, regulations that would benefit farmers. And so, all my life, I've been involved with the agricultural industry and voting for the rights and, and for the benefit of farmers. Now, I'm here this afternoon to talk to you about GMOs, genetic modified organisms. And they were introduced in both our countries in 1996, and there were four crops introduced at that time, and that was canola, corn, soybeans, and cotton. But canola affected us mostly in Canada, and the other three major crops more in the U.S. But they were introduced exactly at the same time. And I'll never forget when they were introduced in 1996, what Monsanto especially told the farmers, increased yields, more nutritious. And I guess the, the, the most important item that caught the farmers' ears when they said less chemical use. So there, and, and uh, then there was the buzzwords. We'd always have sustainable agriculture. We'd now be able to feed a hungry world. And believe me how quickly things started to change, even one or two years after the introduction of GMOs, especially by 1998, two years. Now, there are many issues that arise now with GMOs besides just the farmers. We have the environmental issue. We have the health issue. We have the control of farmers' seeds and plants issue. So as I said, there's many issues that have arisen because now we've had GMOs for almost 15 years. So we know now not what can happen or does happen or will happen, but what really does happen with the introduction of GMOs. And especially our family are, is, has always been very concerned with the environment and the damage with the multiple use of chemicals, insecticides, and pesticides, what the effect is on the environment and human health. Now, maybe before I go any farther, I'll just briefly tell, uh, mention to you what happened to my wife and myself back in 1998, two years after the introduction of GMOs. And uh, Monsanto laid what they called a patent infringement lawsuit against my wife and myself. And they said we were using Monsanto's GMO canola. If I happen to say rapeseed, it's one and the same, uh, without a license from them. And that really startled us because my wife, as I said, and uh, myself to some degree, were seed researchers and developers in canola. And if the last thing that we wanted was to have our research contaminated by GMOs, and we said to Monsanto then, if you have contaminated us, you should be responsible for the damage that you've done to us and our research. And uh, so we stood up to Monsanto, and it went to Federal Court of Canada under patent infringement. And at that time, people didn't even know that there was a patent on a, uh, on a seed with a patent on a gene that was in that seed. Nobody even knew about it. There was no mention of it or anything. So it took two years to go to federal court, one judge. And how often we wished, my wife and I wished that we could have had a judge and jury, a jury with some farmers on that knew and understood about farming. But that was not to be, we only had one judge. After two years of pretrial, it went to trial, and what the judge ruled is what made the case become internationally known overnight. When he said it does not matter under patent law how a farmer is contaminated, whether it's cross-pollination, direct seed movement, or, or pollination by bees and so on, or blown in the wind, or transportation by farmers and so on. And he said, if that happens to any gardener, organic farmer, 
conventional farmer, you no longer own your seeds or plants, they become the ownership, in this case of Monsanto, immediately. And you're not allowed to use your seeds or plants again. Well, that really alarmed people around the world, that how you could lose your rights if you are contaminated to a corporation because they have a patent on it. So he also mentioned another interesting point. He said level of contamination does not matter. If it's a half of 1%, 1%, 2%, you no longer own your seeds or plants, you're not allowed to use them again. So you can imagine, oh, and then he also ruled in our case, all our research and development now becomes the ownership of Monsanto. And that research was over 50 years. So you can imagine how we felt. And at that point in time, my wife and I decided we were gonna fight Monsanto and for the rights of farmers, for if it took the rest of our lives for the freedom and the rights of farmers to use their seed from year to year. Because we knew that farmers shouldn't... <laughs> and we knew, because we were seed developers, how important it was that farmers always maintain that right to develop new varieties of seeds or plants suitable for their climatic or soil conditions in their region. Sure, we were developing new varieties of canola in our region east of Saskatoon, central Saskatchewan. But it, maybe if I went to the province of Alberta or the state of Montana or the province of Manitoba, climatic conditions are different, soil conditions are different, and you may not be successful in developing the variety. So we have a saying back home, one glove in the seed business does not fit all, and you always have to have that development in your local regions or uh, to develop suitable for that region. So, Anyway, to make a long story short, we then took it to the Court of Appeal, the Federal Court of Appeal, Canadian Federal Court of Appeal, three judges this time, and after another two years of legal battle, they ruled in favor of Monsanto, but not on everything. And they, so we lost then twice, after four years or five years of legal battle. But in the meantime, what had happened after that is then Monsanto laid two other lawsuits against us, my wife and myself, one was for a million dollars. Up to that point in time, they said they wanted all their legal expense paid up that time, and it was a million dollars. So we had to fight that. Then they also tried, laid another lawsuit, they tried to seize our home, all our farmland, and all our farm equipment to try and stop us. So we had three lawsuits by the time it went to the Supreme Court of Canada. Now what happened at the Supreme Court of Canada was that we did not have to pay Monsanto no money. And also that we could, we, there was no gag order, we could continue to be free in what we said uh, uh, in regards to what happened at the Supreme Court. But in the meantime, uh, after that, what was not fair, the court, Supreme Court of Canada ruled Monsanto has to pay their legal bill my wife and I have to pay our own legal bill. Monsanto's legal bill was about $2 million by that time. Our legal bill was about a half a million dollars. Now you might say, what was there, why there was such a difference in the amount? Monsanto at one time had 19 lawyers in court, both from the US and Canada. We had one lawyer. Talk about intimidation. So anyway, that was not fair because remember, we did not lay the lawsuit against Monsanto. They laid the lawsuit against us. So. Then what happened after that, the Supreme Court said, it also is a liability issue, but we would have to go back to our local province, and the same as, you, uh, as a state, to lay a liability charge against Mons uh, Monsanto for destroying or contaminating our crop. And two years after the Supreme Court, Monsanto again contaminated one of our fields that we were, my wife and I said, We'll never grow canola again with the experience we have, but we would start doing mustard research and higher yielding yellow mustard research. And into the second year of that research, we noticed that there were canola plants growing in that mustard field. It was only a, about a 50 acre field. And uh, so we notified Monsanto and said, look, we think there's some of your GMO canola in our field again. And because Monsanto had said all during the Supreme Court the trials that all a farmer has to do is notify them if he thinks he's got contamination. Now, uh, so that's what we did. We notified Monsanto. Monsanto came out two days later and took samples of this canola in our field. And after that, they notified us, yes, 
is Monsanto's GMOs in your field again? And they asked us, they asked, oh, especially my wife, what do you want done with the contamination? And my wife said to Monsanto, we are using this field now for mustard research, and it's very difficult to separate canola and mustard because the seeds are almost identical. And she said she wants every canola plant in that 50-acre field of Monsanto pulled out by hand. And Monsanto agreed to do this because there was a reason we wanted that done, because we did not want the seeds to fall onto the, onto the ground. But two days before Monsanto was going to come to remove the canola plants, my wife gets a fax from Monsanto, and it was called a release form. And I tell you, if I ever saw my wife angry in, in my life before, that was one time, because this is what it said in that release form. My wife, myself, or any member of our family could never ever take Monsanto to court again for the rest of our lives, no matter how much they contaminate us in the future. <laughs> the, the other issue was that we were not allowed to be allowed to talk about the terms of settlement, in other words, a gag order. And we decided, we said, there is no way we are ever going to sign, uh, uh, sign away our freedom of speech. Too many of our people in our, both our countries gave our lives, gave their lives for freedom of speech, and we will never give it away to our corporation, and we refuse to sign the document. So. So then the battle was on. <laughs> and we notified Monsanto and said, we are going to remove the plants ourselves with the help of our neighbors. Monsanto sends a nasty fax back and says, we wish to remind you, Mr. and Mrs. Schmeiser, that those plants in your field are not your property. They're our property under patent law, and you're not allowed to do with them what you want. Well, we told Monsanto this. We said, we own the land. We pay the taxes. We're going to do on our land what we, what we intend to do, and we're going to remove the plants. And we notified Monsanto when we were going to do this. And with the help of our neighbors, we removed the plants. And then Monsanto said again, sent this nasty letter, that you, we, if you sign the document, giving up your freedom of speech, we will pay you for the removal, or in other words, the cleanup costs. And the clear cost was $640 that we paid our neighbors to help us, which was really nothing for 50 acres. And so anyway, Monsanto refused to pay it if we didn't sign it. So we sent Monsanto the bill. Monsanto wouldn't pay it unless we signed the document. Finally, we thought, how can we bring this to court without a long extended period of time? And we went to small claims court. $640, and the judge agreed with us, and we had a multi-billion dollar corporation in court on a $640 bill. <laughs> and that made news all over Canada. <laughs> now, when the court started, Monsanto paid, at the beginning, paid the $640 plus $20 cost. And it's, it was not the whole issue of the $640. The whole issue was that they accepted liability. So if you are contaminated as a farmer now, it doesn't matter. A precedent has been set in the courts. If you contaminate and destroy the property of others, you should pay. So it doesn't matter if you're Byers, Sangenta, DuPont, Monsanto in this case, there's a precedent has been set in the Canadian courts now for the liability. Now there's a lot of issues with that. What about if you're an organic farmer? and you're contaminated. And it takes you three or four years to get recertified, to get the contamination out. Who is going to pay for those three or four years that you've lost your organic status? So there's many, many issues, but at least the beginning has, has started with the, with, the, with the Monsanto paying the $640. And believe me, after 10 years of legal battle, it, it was something great for both my wife and myself. Sure, we could have sued them again, in regards uh, to the, what we lost of 50 years in research and development. We didn't want that. We just wanted that a corporation acknowledges liability. So that, as I said, it was a victory for farmers all over the world. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned to you about what Monsanto told us what all GMOs would, uh, GMOs would do. Number one, with GMOs now, and I don't care if it's the uh, northern plains of the U.S. or the prairies of western Canada, 
you are, the farmers are using now at least 10 to 15 times more chemicals than ever, ever before uh, with GMOs. And one of the reasons for that is because new super weeds have developed with the introduction of GMOs. And uh, some of these super weeds uh, really, uh, then the, your rate of yield goes down. So your, uh, your yields go down. In soya, it's approximately 15%. In canola from my Department of Agriculture, it's about 10%. So don't ever believe when they say increased yields or less chemicals. It's exactly the opposite, and that starts showing up within a couple years after the introduction of GMOs. Now, uh, one other point I want to make, and often I forget about it, and my wife is, if she's with me, she'll kind of motion it, uh, and I'll remember it. And this, it's this. GMOs do not only affect the plant you put it into. It affects every plant comes from a family of plants. And what we have found now, that in that family of plants, and I'll give you canola for an example, comes from the brassica family. And in that family, you have radishes, turnips, cauliflower, and so on. And through cross-pollination now, the GMOs are also going into those market garden crops, making more crops. Organic farmers can no longer raise because of, of the contamination. So that's a very, very important point. Now, the other, there's many other important issues I'd like to bring up. Is the, uh, is the, well, first of all, the environmental issue. What is it doing to our environment with a massive increased use of chemicals and the super weeds? You have our water now, our soil, our air contaminated with these new powerful chemicals, toxic chemicals, to try and control the new super weeds. They have come, the company said at the beginning, well, that's no problem, we'll just come up with new, more powerful super chemicals. And indeed, they have to control this new super GMO weed. And it's called, what we have is what we call a 24D-5 ester. But what a lot of people don't know, is that chemical contains 70% Agent Orange. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you remember what Agent Orange did in, in the war in Vietnam. So that's what they're using now to try and control the new super weed. What about, now they said, feed a hungry world. And I think that's all in a hungry and starving world. And I think that's a concern to every one of us. But now good agricultural land in both our countries, whether it's corn, whether it's soybeans, whether it's canola, is now being used for biofuel or biodiesel. And that, uh, to me, I think it's, that's one of the greatest crimes that could happen. Because if I look at the United States, they estimate they'd like to have 20% biofuel. And that would take your total corn production to make 20% biofuel or biodiesel. And so how is that going to feed a hungry world? Now, how bad is it in Canada with GMOs on the two principal crops, and that's soya and canola? We no longer have any pure canola seed left in Canada. If a farmer goes to buy canola seed, it all will contain GMOs because it's all now contaminated. So organic farmers no longer can raise organically canola in Canada or soya. Our total soya supply now is contaminated with GMOs. And it used to really bother me when I went to Europe and they used to tell the Europeans, the Germans, the Austrians, the French, that you can have coexistence. That is absolutely, absolutely impossible. You cannot uh, coexist. You cannot have GMO farmers, you cannot have conventional farmers, and you cannot have can uh, uh, I, I said canola, organic, or GMO farmers. It all becomes, after a few years, GMOs. There is no longer a choice. And then also what I would use to hear at the beginning, they said all a farmer had to do was leave a buffer strip. And they said roughly 10 meters, 5 meters, or 20 meters. I don't care if you leave 100 kilometers or 60 miles. It will spread. You cannot control the wind. You cannot control the bees. You cannot control uh, other birds and so on, or animals. And it will spread. And that is what has happened in a few short years on the northern plains and also in the prairies of western Canada. So you no longer have a choice. And you cannot coexist. And that's what they're still telling to many farmers in different countries of the world today yet. There, 
There is, as I said, there are so many issues. First of all, the rights of farmers. And what they would do is get farmers to sign contracts back, especially in 1996, at the beginning. And in that contract, the farmer basically gave all his rights away. You had to buy the seed from Monsanto. I'll use Monsanto in this case. You had, they had to buy the seeds from Monsanto. They have to buy the chemicals from Monsanto. They have to pay Monsanto a license fee of $15 an acre on the acres they own each year. And they must permit Monsanto's police, force, or investigators, whatever you want to call them, to come on your land for three years after you signed that contract, even though you only grow it for one year. And they can go on your land, they can go on your rain, uh, granaries or, or silos, and they can go and get your tax records, farming records, with or without your permission. So th that right should never ever be taken away from a farmer. And then you may ask, why did a farmer ever sign a contract like that? Well, first of all, it was on the back of the contract, the conditions, and a lot of farm, it was in such small print, and believe me, you needed a magnifying glass to read it, and the farmers signed it without knowing what they have signed. And believe me, they paid dearly later on when they found out they had to buy their seed, their chemicals, and so on. But I think the worst thing was when they had to permit, oh, and I should say that if something went wrong with the seed, they could never ever take Monsanto to court. A farmer gave up his right to take the company even to court. And that's why we fought so hard that a farmer, that we would never give up our rights to our freedom of speech or sign anything like that to give a, a farmer or a company total control over you. Um, I'm speaking at a university. My wife and I have 19, uh, well, I should say, 15 grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, and five children of our own. Of our grandchildren, there are six of our grandchildren in university at the present time. And that's one thing I don't want to see our grandchildren that are in university now to lose their academic freedom. And the reason I say that is this. How many of our universities are now funded to some degree in, such, in certain programs by the corporations? And but in doing so, a lot of the research goes in the direction of what the companies want. And, 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 and I know that there's a lot of them, like Harvard, at which I've been at, at Berkeley, uh, that they feel that it's good to have this outside money in. And I say to them, how, much, how prepared are you to give up the autonomy of your university? And because the direction will go, research will go in the direction of what the corporation want. And after that research is done, it does not belong to the university. It becomes the ownership of a company like, in this case, Monsanto. So if, if when, uh, as a graduate, you, I feel that you should have the freedom to express what you have developed or research and what you have found, whether it's good or if it's not so good. And that's what will happen when you lose your academic freedom, that you can't give out exactly what your research, research has shown. So that's one thing that you should be very, very concerned about my family is very concerned about it, and a lot of our friends are concerned about it at universities back home, that we should not give up our autonomy of our university to a corporation, because you lose your freedom. And who really paid for these universities in the beginning? It was the people, you and I. Now a corporation comes in and gives X number of dollars, gets a research, and basically controls your university. And that, should, and that has to stop. And the only way that will stop is that the funding has to go back to the public purse, not to corporations. And, that, and that's where a lot of the governments, including my government, thought, well, here's an easy way to get money uh, to fund the universities. But they're paying dearly for now and giving up their rights to that university. So never ever give up your rights to university by giving, taking money from corporations, unless you have a, a, full pull, a foolproof agreement that you don't lose that research control. So that's another area that I'm very concerned about. Another issue with GMOs. I don't know how many of you here know about the Terminator gene. Now I'll speak briefly on that. A Terminator gene, and it's, uh, they really tried to bring it in, in in US and Canada about three, four years ago. I don't, not too sure what's happening in US, but I know it has been stopped in Canada. Terminator gene is a gene that's put into a seed that all the, uh, and when it becomes a plant, 
And when the seeds become a plant, all the seeds from that plant are sterile. In other words, you cannot use it uh, for further. So your fertility is, is gone. Now the danger of that, this terminator gene can cross-pollinate into an organic field, into a conventional farmer's field, and render all those seeds and plants also sterile. To me, these companies call themselves life science. And I think it's the greatest assault we've ever seen in humanity when they come out with a gene that destroys the future of life. And that gene can be inserted in any higher life form. And that's another area you should be very concerned about. The companies wanted to bring it in, especially Monsanto, two and three years ago, and it was not allowed in Canada. Like I said, I'm not so sure about the US, but I don't think it's allowed here. But so you can just see, again, what genetic manipulation, what they all can do. There's, there's many other areas that I'm concerned about, and I, I think the area that people in both our countries are now the most concerned about, what is in your food? And that's what the meeting in Washington, D.C. this past week was all about, the right to know. Now, we don't have labeling in North America in both Canada and the United States. In Europe, they have. Europeans know what's in their food. And so they can choose if they want to eat GMOs or not. And so that's why GMOs have not gone over in Europe and not allowed even to be brought in as human food. So why don't they want to bring in our labeling in North America? Why are the companies against it? Why is our, both our governments against labeling? And the reason for that is this is that they have now found many health issues with the new genes that are put into uh, our seeds and plants. And if you had labeling, uh, then if you have some sort of ailment and you went to a doctor, they could ask you what type of foods you are, are eating and a database could be built up. And that's why they don't want labeling here in North America, for that one major reason. And I think that's why there's such a movement also now in the United States and Canada, the right to know. And to me also, there's another thing that comes up. If you don't know, one of the most important things in our life is the food that we eat, what's in that food. I think it's a drastic violation of human rights. Everyone should have that right to know. We as parents, grandparents, what we're feeding to our children and, and, and especially babies. So, Stand up for that one particular thing, demand labeling, and that's something everyone can do, that you want to know what's in your food. Four or five years ago, my wife felt so strong. <laughs> so strongly on this subject that we took Canada to the United Nations Human Rights Commission in Geneva and charged Canada for drastic violations of human rights on this particular subject that we should have the right to know it's a drastic violation, as I said, of human rights. So it was not easy to take my own country to court, but we felt it was so wrong that we did not have the right to know. So that's a very, very important issue to remember, the right to know what's in your food. You are what you eat, but if you don't know what you're eating, so it's a big... Now, there's many other issues I could go into. Um, and I'm trying to, being at a university, to trying to think of some of the most important things in the environment. I mentioned briefly about the massive increased use of chemicals. What is it doing to our, our, our air, our water, our soil, and so on? And believe me, when farmers tell me, and when I was still farming myself, and you would drive into a field with a swather or a combine, and you'd run over dead deer, dead foxes, dead coyotes from the chemicals you sprayed to, uh, to kill the insects or, the, or to kill the, the plants, the weeds, or so on. So that is what it's doing to our environment. But what about human health with the massive use increase of chemicals? And I said at least 15 times more chemicals when the companies told us less chemical use. Then what about the starving people of the world? How are we going to feed the starving people, hungry people of the world, when, when now we're making biodiesel and ethanol and stuff from food that should be going to people? Other issues.
that come up, I feel is to control what GMOs to me really means was this, with the introduction of GMOs, is to get control of the world's seed supply, which would then give them control of the world's food supply. Monsanto, and I'll go back to Monsanto, used to be one of the largest chemical companies on the face of this earth, based in St. Louis, Missouri. They are no longer concentrated on chemicals, although they have they still their, their flagship chemical Roundup herbicide, but they are now the largest seed company in the world. They've been buying seed companies up around the world, so that gives them control of the world's seed supply. And what really alarms me is they're buying up a lot of organic seed companies, especially along the West Coast here in, and in British Columbia and in Ontario, that make it very difficult for organic farmers to get certain varieties of organic seeds. So if, if Monsanto can't control the organic farmers or destroy them, one way, they'll get control of that seed supply. So that's another thing. They are now the world's largest seed company, going from a chemical to a world's largest seed company. Another th reason to be very, very concerned about it. Another issue, I think very important to human health, and I almost forgot about it, is that, first of all, we used to have one gene, transfer a gene from one life form to another, and in this case, a gene into canola to make it resistant to their herbicide uh, uh, roundup. But remember, when you transfer that gene, you can never transfer that gene by itself. You have to use a virus, or you have to use a bacteria as a vector, or in the case of canola, you have to use an antibiotic-resistant marker gene. But now, they have not only one or two genes in, they have in corn, commercial corn, they have up to eight genes in. So when you eat corn now, you can have an insecticide in it, you can have a pesticide in it, you can have a virus or a bacteria that was never ever in your food before. And then we call that gene stacking. And that started about two years ago in corn here in the United States. So that's another area of really big concern. And we cannot find out what the other six genes are, what they exactly do, because it's private information. The government will not give it to us. Another important issue is this. All the documentation supplied to our governments, now I'll go to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They only used the data supplied to them by Monsanto. They did no research or anything on it, only the data, and they said, because Monsanto said to our government, and said it's substantially equivalent, it's the same as regular food. But then on the other hand, Monsanto says to the patent office, it's different, it's novel, and that's why we need a patent to protect it. So on one hand they say it's substantially equivalent, on the other hand they say it's different, we need a, a patent on it. Now, in that regard, I took all the documentation, and this in this case, canola, to, that was submitted to the Canadian government, by Monsanto, that it was substantially equivalent, that it was safe, and everything else. And I took all that documentation to the School of Science in Japan. And in the report, finally, to the Health Ministry of Japan, by the, uh, by the science, they said that all the documentation submitted to the Canadian government by Monsanto was fraudulent and falsified. And yet, when you say, the, the, uh, the else, Monsanto will say, it's safe, we have approval from the Federal Department of Agriculture in the United States and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but it's based only on the data supplied to them by the corporation. So they do, do, they do not do any testing themselves. They only use the data supplied to them by the various corporations. And to me, I think that's absolutely criminal that the government does not do any testing themselves or will only use the data supplied to them by the corporation. That's like put, putting a fox in charge of a chicken coop. So, so, so that's another region, uh, area that I, I'm really, really concerned about, and I think everyone should be concerned about that, that we do not have the proper testing, and we show now with the health issue uh, what has happened. Now, another major issue is this. A lot of people don't know that a lot of our prescription drugs now are, are being made or developed by genetic altered plants, GMOs. Six major drugs at the time being, and there's more, are produced by, by, by drugs. And I, if I can think from memory, industrial enzymes, growth hormones, blood thinners, uh, contraceptive drugs, uh, blood thinners and so on, are being produced by, by plants. 
what happens, how much of those drugs are we eating through cross-pollination, we don't know. It was primarily initially put into, in, into corn, uh, especially in the state of Missouri. And so we don't know how much contamination of that is in your food. Now, I, I had a doctor, I met with a doctor one time from Oregon, and he was given different examples of that. And he said, he said, what happens if a woman is pregnant and then she eats a food contaminated with a contraceptive drug in. He gave another example. If somebody's had surgery, and then he comes home and eats a food with a blood thinner in. So these are things that are happening. It's not make-believe or some science fiction. This is what we got out there right now, and these companies were able to get so far so fast without anybody knowing about it. But these are the things we've found out in the last 15 years, what is going on. And there, there are many, many areas now that contain to some degree GMOs in. And I think in Canada, in the United States, they say there's about 65 of our foods now to some degree have GMOs in it because a lot of the food is made like say corn syrup. How many of, of our foods has that in with the GMOs? So it's in major, major uh, portion of the foods that we are eat. Again, we have the right to know what's in our food, and the quicker we can get labeling, the better it is. The companies know that people will shy away from eating GMOs. Um, as I mentioned, I think everyone here today is concerned about our future generations. As I said, my wife and I have 18 grandchildren, and if we don't do, my wife and I and many others, if we don't do something now, it'll be too late. We don't know at this time if you ever can bring back a new life form once you've put it into the environment. I've talked to many scientists around the world, they say at the present time they do not know if they ever can bring back a new life form or a GMO once it's been put into the environment. And so that's something we've got to be very, very concerned about. We're really at a fork in the road because we don't want any more GMOs, because they want to bring in GMO Weizen, I'm sorry, GMO wheat, I started speaking German, GMO wheat, GMO alfalfa, and so on, and it has been, been able to be stopped. But they're going to keep trying and trying to bring it in. So there's a, a major, major battle ahead if you want food that is safe, food that is nutritious, and food, I, that's another thing that I should mention. Some of the GMO foods now contain only 50% of the nutritional content than what was in your food before. And broccoli especially is a, is a good example. So a lot of parents feel that they're feeding the proper diet to their children when indeed they're not because it does not have the nutritional content. There is a movement afoot now that a lot of our vegetables should be re-examined to the nutritional value in them now because it's different than what it used to be under organic or conventional methods. Uh, so I think it's very, very important. I don't want to leave a legacy and my wife doesn't want to leave a legacy of our land, our air, our water, and our soil full of poisons. We want to leave a legacy of that our air, our soil, and our water do not have poisons. And I think everyone that is here wants to have the same objective and do the same thing. But we have to do something now. And I think by, by having labeling as a good way to start, you can approach your representatives, your members of parliament, as we would say, and contact that you want to know. You have the right and that it's a violation of your race that you don't know what's in your food. So I think with that, I will close. Uh, there's many, many other areas, but I think there's a lot of questions, and a lot of times when you have questions, a lot of other items come up. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank the university for bringing me here. I tried to cover some of the issues, but there's many issues. Like I said, there's the whole law issue, which I didn't touch on. Well, the first question I got is one that um, cuts right to your um, personal story. Um, you're talking about your grandchildren. Why do not your grandchildren want to have the opportunity to 
Well, first of all, there was a lot of um, opposition. The, the National Farmers Union of Canada took a very strong stand against it. It went also to court, but the, Orga uh, the Organic Farmers Association lost because they, they took Monsanto to the court under a class action lawsuit and uh, they did not qualify under provincial law or state law for all the qualifications for a class action lawsuit. So what we said, individual farmers of, or organic farmers should individually take Monsanto to the court. And then uh, some people said, well, they should take a thousand organic farmers from our province and, and lay a small claims court against Monsanto individually, then Monsanto wouldn't have one case, they'd have a thousand cases on their hands. But anyway, there's a, there was a lot of resistance to GMOs. Well, wheat, we're very, very concerned that it never be introduced in wheat. As I mentioned before, most plants come from a family of plants, and wheat comes from the grass family, and if you'd ever, ever introduce it into wheat, you'd totally destroy the organic farmers. It would be impossible to have an organic farmer if it ever was introduced into wheat, and that's why we're very concerned that it never, and on the prairies and North Dakota and Montana, we were very, and Kansas, Nebraska, high in wheat production. The next one is, um, what's the most important action we as students can take now to fight for something? Uh, I think that the most important action you can do is become aware. Go on the internet and get all the information that you can. And I, I'm speaking what I felt was the most effective, what I've seen in Europe, and I spent a lot of time in Europe, especially uh, Austria, Germany, France, Italy, Poland, and so on, is that they, were able to stop it just from the fact that people knew what they were eating and they wouldn't eat it. So I, I think that's an effective way of stopping. I should mention this. What the Europeans are really concerned about is that uh, they used to say, Monsanto used to say there was no horizontal transfer in a body. And that was totally, totally false. They said that the GMOs, if you ate GMO food, it would pass through you. That is absolutely, absolutely false. The GMOs will enter through your stomach lining, but primarily through your intestines, into the bloodstream and into your body. And so you'll have GMOs if you eat the uh, GMO food. Now, what the Europeans are uh, concerned about, if you feed GMO feed to an animal, and then eventually you eat the, the, uh, the flesh of that animal, you are eating GMOs because it's in the flesh of that animal. So that's an important thing to remember. And at first the companies used to say that there was no horizontal transfer. There is horizontal transfer. It does go into your body. Well, Monsanto will never say that in, in, um, in public to us because you know, they'd have a, a, a lawsuit on their hands. But I'll tell you, it was not easy to stand up to a corporation like Monsanto. It was a living hell for my wife and myself, my neighbors, to stand up to. They threaten us, they threaten our neighbors, that they stand up for a person in Louise, they're going to come after them and destroy them. But I think the worst thing was when one of Monsanto's representatives, and I was speaking at Cape Town in South Africa at Parliament, and coming out of the Parliament, my wife and I ran face to face with one of Monsanto's representatives from Johannesburg, and he shook his fist in my wife's face and my face and said, nobody, nobody stands up to Monsanto. We're going to get both of you somehow, someday, and destroy you both. And don't believe me, we always keep looking over our shoulder. Because we're, we know we don't have our heads in the sand, by me speaking here today, Monsanto knows it, and, and they, I, we know that as long as we keep talking about Monsanto, they're going to come after us. We don't know when or where, but we live in that pier every day. Well, 
Monsanto goes to any into any field they want to, and they'll take samples of that farmer's crop. Or what they will do, they'll drive alongside a farmer's field, and they'll have a, what they call, uh, they have little spray cans, and they'll spray a little bit of the herbicide Roundup on the farmer's canola field, and in 10 days or 12 days after the Roundup has time to activate, they'll come back and check. And if the plants have died, they know the farmer was not using Monsanto seed, or a gene with Monsanto seed in, and if it uh, hasn't died, they know the farmer was using. Now what they also do on the prairies, they'll use a small plane or a helicopter, and they'll fly over a farmer's field, and they'll drop what we call a Monsanto herbicide spray bomb, Roundup spray bomb, on a farmer's field, and it generally will cover about 20 to 30 feet across, and a week later, or 10 days or 12 days later, they'll fly back and check these spots and if the crop has died, you know the farmer wasn't using Monsanto's GMOs, or if it hasn't died, the farmer was using Monsanto's, with Monsanto's trait or gene in it. So I'm not talking about a third world country. This is what's happening in our country with a corporation. Can you repeat? They'll spray any farm that they chose to do so. And if you lay, uh, lay a complaint to the police, the police will tell you, you can lay the complaint, we'll take the charge, but they'll say, you'll spend six, seven years of your life in court, they'll fight you till you have no money left. So it's the power of money that they can suppress farmers' rights and freedom of speech. And that's one thing we would not give up, my wife and I, our freedom of speech. It's genetic altered um, um, that they, they put the genes in from those, and I don't exactly, but the, if you go on the internet, you'll find a lot of information about that. Just Google it in. But I gave you primarily the most important. There could be more uh, uh, drugs now to produce, and the reason they do that, it's a lot cheaper, as I said, to produce drugs by plants than by doing it in the lab. It's all about, again, about money. So we can. Okay, okay I, I've spent a, quite a bit of time in Mexico, especially the state of Oaxaca and in Guatemala, and I would say at the present time, of the 10,000 varieties of Mexican corn, 5,000 are now contaminated with GMOs. And you may ask me, where, how did the contamination come from? I hate to say it, but it came by, from American Food Aid, where they gave, instead of milled corn, they gave whole kernel corn and that's how the contamination came, because the corn that was given as food aid was GMO corn. So, um, so per seed, uh, it's really important for us to hear how you respond to the critics, because once you go, then that's what you get. There's faculty here at Western in the business school talking about this particular case, for example, and it's hard to answer them. So back to this question. Mm -hmm. the GM corn and the allegation, I can't wrap my head around this, yeah. the allegation is that for this, this, these seeds that maybe that, that drifted on, that you harvested those seeds and somehow planted yeah. 90% of your thousand acres. Uh -huh. and Okay, what, it's a misplay of words of how, what they said is that when they, I had University of Manitoba, because we were seed developers, do, we had eight particular fields, we had a scientist University of Manitoba to come. Some of our, two of our fields had no contamination, some had 1%, 8%, and so on. But what Monsanto is saying of the variety of GMOs that they found in their field was 98% Monsanto's not the level. It was 98% or, well, they, first they said it was 90%, then they said it was 98 The type of canola, uh, GMOs that were in our field was Monsanto's was 98%. There was some Liberty Link and some Pursuit Smart. But the variety, it's not the total percentage. 
See, that's how, that's a play of words. They make it sound like our total field was 98% Monsanto's GMOs. No, no, the variety was 98% Monsanto that was in there. But it was percentage wise, but the judge will, level of contamination didn't matter. See, that's what we, and, and uh, so that's, but you go to the website, I think they say that, but they leave the impression that our whole field was 98%. The variety that was contaminated. And that's why Monsanto uh, uh, had to pay for action, in this case, the contamination cleanup cost too. But it makes it sound like I had 98%. You know, even if you bought seed from Monsanto and planted it, you'd never have 98% germination. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any variety, if you're lucky to get 90% so, uh, germination of any varieties uh, of, uh, when you buy it from a pedigree or, or, or heirloom seed. That's another thing I'm very concerned about with the cross-pollination. What will happen to our indigenous seed and heirloom seeds with cross-pollination? And that's a big concern out there. Sure, they're having seed banks. They have the big one in Norway now. And I question that one because that's sponsored by the Gates uh, and uh, Rockefeller Foundation. And it again shows you how they're going to have total control of the world seed supply in the future when our indigenous and heirloom seeds are all contaminated. Just like the, uh, and that's one thing I feel really sorry about the Mexicans. When here seed, you know, uh, corn is almost like a, in some of their religion, they're like a god. And now it's being contaminated, and they're losing their corn. And a lot of times when we had, uh, in Canada and the United States, when we had some variety of corn or so that was whatever disease it got into, you could go to Mexico and get new varieties of corn to start over. We we're going to lose that. And that's something to be very concerned about. But I'm like, glad that you brought this up about Monsanto. Okay, what uh, happened, because you have to remember, we grew it in, it was actually a 1977, or 1998 crop. And as I mentioned, it took year, two years before to go to court. Well then, our, the, uh, so it went into commercial supply, like, like we always did, uh, to sell it. And, uh, but we didn't know it at that time, yet it was Monsanto's GMOs. And so we sold it, and I, the uh, total income from that field or all our fields of canola was 130 some thousand dollars, something like that. Then Monsanto said that they wanted all that 130 some thousand dollars. But they, the Supreme Court ruled that we didn't have to pay Monsanto any money at all. Uh, and one of the reasons for, uh, that um, was kind of, in a way, hilarious when the Supreme Court said that the reason we don't have to pay Monsanto any money is because we did not benefit by having Monsanto's GMOs on our field. Well, we lost 50 years of research and it was contamination. Um, what I think has to be done is we never use the precautionary principle. You maybe have heard that already. There was not enough testing done before it was introduced. It was all about getting, sell more chemicals and control of the seed supply. So I'm not, I'm not against future development or research, but it should not be let out until there's a, it's proven. There's been no proof whatsoever that it has you know, increased yields. Because if you just stop to think, how does putting a gene into a plant produce, make it produce more when all it does is save that plant from using a chemical on? It has nothing to do about increased yields. See? And that's what they're saying, increased yields, more nutrition. It has, I, I've talked to uh, David Suzuki, I don't know if you've heard of him from uh, BC, and he said if we were to start today and to put all our efforts into to develop drought resistance, 
and different resistance uh, and stuff. He said in 25 years from now, we may be lucky because then you have to do that. You have to total restructure the whole plant. So it's all, it sounds good. And that bothers me. When they show pictures on television of starving African children, and the next picture they show healthy, with GMOs, healthy African uh, children. Look at the Green Revolution, what it has done to Africa. Increased chemicals and increased use of fertilizers. Can you repeat? Uh, what can we do to protect indigenous heirloom bees Pardon? from being contaminated? What? So the heirloom and indigenous bees you're talking about that have been contaminated, what can we do to protect them? Well, the only thing is that you don't allow anything in that family close to anywhere as close to that particular seeds. But a lot of the heirloom and, and indigenous seeds, and remember, once they're contaminated, you don't own them. They become the ownership of the corporation. Under patent law, and that's that's where uh, uh, the Supreme Court said that the whole issue of the patents on life—they use the term patents on life—has to go back to the Parliament of Canada to bring in new laws, new regulations to protect people's life and protect the future of life. But that hasn't happened yet. With all the problems of GMOs you point out, why do farmers continue to buy it? You're in, they're in a situation now. If you want to like. Uh, like we grow, grow a lot of canola in our region. If you want to buy canola, or seed canola, you can only buy GMO canola. There is no other kind. I had a phone call last spring from the, I forget which one, university in the state of New York, and they wanted to know where they could find non-GMO canola. And I said, I can get you some from Germany or from Australia. But I said, why would you want to grow it? I said, unless you use it in close facilities, by the time harvest comes, it's going to be contaminated. So Canada produces no non-GMO? You cannot buy. By us anyway. And there is no pure GMO-free canola left. It's all contaminated. In the U.S., in corn crops, you have other choices besides GMO crops. Yeah, in the United States, the latest figure I got this week, 80% of your corn now is GMO in the United States. That's from your Department of Agriculture. So eventually it will all be GMO also here. So a lot of you may not know, but here in Bellingham, uh, there's a non-GMO project, and we are currently looking for interns. So if you have an interest, um, you can go to our website. I have to talk to the CHA and there's the FHA Trade Association are circulating around. I should mention also that in the transfer of the gene, I just touched on it briefly before, that when you transfer a gene, you have to use either a virus or a bacteria. And it's an agrobacteria they use. And in some, it's a virus. And that virus comes from the cauliflower mosaic virus. And just look up what's all in the cauliflower mosaic virus family. And in the case of canola, like on the prairies, they use an antibiotic-resistant marker gene in that transfer of that gene. So um, a lot of our people in our rural areas and certain types of antibiotics now are totally and totally immune to antibiotics from breathing in the pollen during the pollination stage. So that's another big problem. At first they said doctors were prescribing too much antibiotics. That wasn't the reason at all. So that's a major uh, concern we have. The go government of, Mon of Canada gave Monsanto up to 2010 to stop using the antibiotic resistant marker gene because of that problem. Monsanto was not able to come up with a new vector or promoter to transfer that gene into uh, canola. And they, were, they did get permission from the Canadian federal government for an extension to 2015. In the meantime, the damage continues. But that shows you the power these corporations have with our governments. Okay, it, um, it is United Nations Human Rights Commission, so it's, it's not a lawsuit. You take them on a complaint. 
uh, a violation of human rights. Uh, about the lawsuit was the one where I had, well, I mentioned the last one where we had a small claims action, and then all the other lawsuits was Monsanto against us. Well, we complained as citizens the violation because we don't know what's in our food. Canada has not answered to that complaint as yet. And that's in Geneva. Every, every uh, so many years, you can take a certain country uh, to, court, uh, to the Human Rights Commission in Geneva under the United Nations. What the Supreme Court, well, first of all, at the, what they call the first trial, the, uh, the judge ruled that we were guilty. And then it ended up in the Supreme all, all after seven years, it ended up in the Supreme Court said that we did not profit by anything, we didn't have to pay anything. So that was a major difference. Well, my wife has been an organic farmer all her life. And many years ago, she said we should put our whole farm into organic. I wish I would have listened to her 30, 40 years ago. But uh, anyway, I've always, we've been always eating organic food because she's always raised her family. She comes from an organic background. That's why she was doing the, resort, uh, the research and so on. So we've always been subject to organic foods. Oh, sure. Well, there is a rumor about, they said that uh, I should be cloned and Monsanto has two people to fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead.
Thank you. Well, like I said, our legal battle was about a half a million dollars. What we'd done, we put mortgages on our farmland and everything else. We're still paying off because, you know, we didn't have that kind of money, but we had help from all over the world. You know, from average people and, and, and organizations. And we wouldn't have had that, we couldn't have continued on. But we paid a price for it. Everything that we saved for all our life, and, but we felt it was so worthwhile. Our organic laws in both our countries, in fact, Canada up to two years ago was using the organic criteria uh, from the United States, but then Europe said that Canada has to have its own organic uh, uh, regulations, which we now have. If it says organic, I'd be almost 100% it is. There's just some pretty strict procedures in that regards, and if it's not organic and they would be charges, it would be quite, quite a stiff penalty. I, I didn't quite. They could be uh, contaminated, but not very many. But uh, there is testing they can do to see if there's GMO in it or not. Okay. You see, I'll give you an example. What they, the, some of the latest things like Monsanto uses, all they have to do is drive by a canola field, take a leaf, put it into a vial of chemical, uh, and it can tell immediately if it's GMO or not. So there's a lot of sophisticated ways now of testing whether the food has GMOs or not. Says that the two 
Okay, the full question. So, you said that um, some companies have been um, sued for labeling things as non GMO. Yeah. Monsanto says when there's, and it, this has happened in the U.S., when a company labeled it non-GMO, Monsanto took them to court and said they're implying that uh, the GMOs are not good. And that's why uh, they can sue a company on that premise that they're insinuating that GMOs are not good by labeling this is non-GMO. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's happened, and so that's why you don't see that labeling here. But that has to be changed. That can only be changed by your government, and not my government. Well, uh, I don't know. We hope it never comes to that, but I, I can give you one story where uh, a lady, a Monsanto's rep, came to the lady's door. Of a farm. It was on a farm, and they wanted to go into their field, and she said, we don't use Monsanto's products. You get out of here, and you get out past. And he kind of got sarcastic. And she did have a shotgun in the front door. And she said, if you don't get out here in so many seconds, you won't be walking. You might be crawling, but you won't, you won't be walking while he left. But that's the only incident that I know. But farmers, by and large, are more conservative and that they rather not cause a trouble. And a lot of farmers have taken stuff that they should not have been taking. But they, I'll give you an example. What farmer has twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to stand up when they found, find Monsanto's representatives in their field trespassing, but you have to lay a charge. And, and if you go to the police and lay a charge, then Monsanto fights you. And the people don't have that, farmers don't have that kind of money, or anybody doesn't have the money to fight a corporation like that. And that's, you know, we say, uh, we have a legal system in Canada, but do we really have justice for the average person? And I say no. I've always, through all the court cases, tried to act in a, in a non-violent way. Yeah, yeah, and and um, yeah. Well, organic farmers of Canada. I mean, of my province of Saskatchewan, a thousand of them banded together, and and still, after four years, five years, and a half a million dollars, their uh, their uh, class action lawsuit was thrown out. I think, I think just what the gentleman here mentioned before is the first thing to demand as on a human race. You write to know what's in your food. That's the first thing. Does that directly impact you? Oh, yes. Because then uh, uh, you wouldn't have that GMOs coming in so much because uh, if farmers cannot sell their GMOs, they're not going to raise it. If you're a merchant and you bring a product in that doesn't sell, you don't bring it in anymore. You get something else. The same thing with food. <laughs> Can you? Yes, true. Uh, I think we've lost a lot. If you look uh, how many varieties of seeds and plants we've lost in the last 15 years, not only the last 100 years, but in the last 10, 15 years, 
we're losing a lot of our di uh, biodiversity, and I think that's uh, it, that is terrible. And there's, it's major, major. Look in any variety, whether it's tomatoes, potatoes, or anything, how many varieties have been lost, and now that, and that's what I think my wife and I, as seed developers, were so, so concerned about. With GMOs, if you get down to one variety of seeds or plants and you have some disease, some blight, some disaster, you've got nothing to fall back on. And that's why it's so of a concern to us not to lose that biodiversity. And that's a major issue amongst a lot of people.